today, Dr. Tracy Wiley. Silicon Valley, and I just loved, I walk a lot, so, <laughs> and we are in Arizona because I can feel it. And there's some Cokes that you can put in the back for me. Um, you know, I just love technology. Um, a lot of times it doesn't work. Usually it's my fault. I forget to plug things in. But, um, you know, I'm not alone with it because I'm just walking around and I'm seeing how many smartphones are out there. And there's like as many smartphones as there are people in the world. It's like 7 billion now. My friends at CompuCom told me in the U.S. adults now have three devices. You have a laptop, a tablet, and a smartphone. So we're pretty connected. If you're on LinkedIn, like me, come find me. I'd like to find you. But two people join every second. It's amazing. If you're on Facebook, yes, I already took two posts. If we added up all the Facebook users in the world, we'd be the third largest country in the world. Is that amazing? And you know what's interesting? It just happened so fast. And thank you for the career selfie. I actually saw this statistic that Google published that we take 93 million <laughs> selfies per day on our Androids. We don't know how many on the iPhone, right? That's crazy. We became digital overnight, and that's what this is about. I did research at Stanford and when I was running a research institute and looked at what is happening in the digital world for the future of work. What kinds of skills do we need to think about? What is happening in our lives and our careers? And do we really need to have to take a career selfie? Okay, this is, this is the moment Tracy can turn it off. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> love technology, you just gotta start to work. So what I'm gonna do is go over some of the findings from the research. Don't worry, I'm not gonna bore you with the research details. I try to bring it to life using some multimedia. Some of the forces that are changing or affecting work, some of the skills, and then what it means to you. Okay, <clears throat> first trend. Extreme longevity. Out of any industry, here we are in healthcare, you know this. People are living longer, right? Living to 100 or 100 plus. You've probably seen the press, right? A baby born today, if we can edit their DNA. We can take magic pills now that help us live to 173. It's an amazing phenomenon that we're living so much longer than in the past. And that impacts us, right, and how we think about work. In fact, I went out to 200 executives and said, if you're living to 100, what does that mean to you? And they said, oh my God, I actually haven't thought about living to 100. It's a pretty daunting concept. But if I have to live to 100, I actually have to afford to live to 100. And if I have to afford to live to 100, that means I'm gonna have to work until I'm um, 80, 80, my parents didn't tell me I was gonna work till 80. They said I'd probably work until my 50s. But how am I gonna to afford to live to 100? The only way is I'm gonna to have to work till 80. That means I'm gonna to have to work maybe for 50, 60, oh my God, 70 years. I see some young people in there, you're gonna be working until you're 90, you're gonna live to 150. Oh my God, which means I have to stay healthy enough, educated enough, technical enough to be able to work this much longer span. But on the executive side, the corporate side, in the workforce, you know that this is impacting you too. You have probably three generations in the workforce. I think so. Some companies tell me they have four generations in the workforce. Five generations in the workforce. McDonald's tells me their youngest employee is 14 and a half. Now it's Gen Z, part-time on a permit. Walmart tells me their oldest employee is 101. He is a gardener in Bentonville and he's very popular, but now we're moving into our silent generation. And somehow or another, we as leaders in our companies, we have to make all of this work, right? All of these generations, because you know what happens. Every generation has a different idea about what work should look like. Every generation has a different idea about what leadership should be. Every generation has a different idea about work-life balance, right? 
Every generation brings in different kinds of contributions. And we all have to kind of sort it out in the office. <coughs> what I usually hear about, though, the most is that every generation has different ideas about technology. Some generations love it. They want everything on social media. They want everything on an app. Right? Why can't we be more automated? It's efficient. And then we have other generations that say, I can't stand technology. We're so successful without it. Why on earth would we try to fix something that isn't broken and introduce all of this training and new technology? Some generations are a little bit like me. We didn't grow up with it, but we start to see the value of it and we get hooked on it. And we'll say, okay, I like using technology if you help me along. It makes me think about a YouTube video. I'm sure you've seen it. If not, it's out there. It's about a young generation Y millennial girl who gives her dad, presumably a baby boomer, an iPad for his birthday. And she stops by to see how he's liking the gift. The problem is he loves the gift, but he thinks it's a cooking utensil. <laughs> Let's take a look. Sag mal, Papa, habe ich dich noch gar nicht gefragt. Wie kommst du eigentlich mit dem neuen iPad zurecht, was wir dir zum Geburtstag geschenkt haben? Gut. Bei den ganzen Apps kommst du klar? Was denn für Apps immer wir sind? in our research group, Think Tank, talked about what it's like to run a company today. The word comes actually from the Army War College of what it's like to be a military soldier in the middle of battle. It's volatile, it's uncertain, and it's complex and ambiguous. For example, companies today may have a natural disaster. Well, maybe not snow in Arizona. Maybe I should have put something else in. But it could really change your whole supply chain. It could wipe out a hospital. It could wipe out people getting to facilities. Cyber attacks. Those didn't exist years ago, right? And all of a sudden now we're protecting our data and our networks, particularly in your industry. Terrorism. When did that come up, right? Starting with pressure cookers, right? And all of a sudden we have to worry about flying, right? And going to events. And startups. You actually never really know when that itty bitty startup could come out of nowhere and actually eat your lunch. Think about it. Netflix, Bye Bye Blockbuster, right? Uber. Who heard of Uber six years ago? No, they didn't exist. And now all of a sudden everybody's, everybody's Uber. I'm Uber. I do Uber every day. Somewhere because it's efficient. Little startup come out of nowhere, Airbnb. Oh my goodness, every time I talk to someone, I say, where are you going to stay? And they say, Airbnb, Airbnb. Whoever thought that we could change the industry because of technology. VUCA world, this is what leaders talk about. We need people, we need people who can actually understand how to maneuver their companies through this different kind of environment. Smart machines and automation. I'm always asked, is technology going to replace jobs, create jobs, or displace jobs? And I actually say it's all three. Because in some areas, if you're not reskilling, it could replace you. In some areas, when I worked at Apple, we were creating, just look at all your phones, that's creating jobs, because now you need people to make apps and holders and all kinds of selfie sticks and widgets to use, right? And that's all job creation. But it's up to us, really, to, to think about how we can retain and up our skills. I'm going to show you. I was in New York City, and I walked by this hotel. It's called the Yotel. And there was this, this machine, a robot, in the window. It's actually called um, a Yobot. It's a bellboy. They had actually replaced all their bellboys with robotic bellboys. Let me uh, give you a look. <laughs> The way that it works 
first is that the bellboy meets you at the door, picks up your luggage, automatically opens up a storage area for you. You text or alert them when you want to go or go in and out, and actually the robot will pull it out for you and have it waiting for you. Right? And so everyone always asks what happened to the bellboys. And I got asked enough. Right? Because it is a good question is, you know, now that we're completely replaced by robotics, what happens to these people? So I went back to the hotel and said, what happened to the bellboys? Got to know. They said, you know, Tracy, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of the bellboys, unfortunately, had to go because they didn't want to do any other job in the hotel. They didn't want to up their skills. They only want to be bellboys, so we had to let them go. They said, but one bellboy, Actually, it was quite interesting. He took his skills and went to the manufacturer of the yoga and said, I am the best bellboy, subject matter expert, that you will ever meet in New York. Right? Got that New York attitude there. And I understand this technology, these robotics. So you need me to be your director of operations because I can sell these robots to other hotels. And they said, we're really fascinated with this gentleman because he actually upped his skills, pitched himself, and became director of operations for the Yobac company and is doing exceptionally well. Think about technology and how it can assist you to reinvent yourself and up your skills. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, in healthcare alone, or in our industry, think about things that were already on the scene. Most of the industry projects we already have robotic helpers with us well into our senior years. In fact, we'll use different kinds of technologies for our patients, for ourselves. There are now Alzheimer GPS shoes out there that will help us remember or get found if we're lost. And we'll even have robotic emotional companions like Pepper, someone who can actually read our eyes and understand if we're happy or sad and actually be our own companion. So the reality is, is that we need, in organizations, new kinds of leaders, different than the leaders in the past. It's actually a more robust leader, someone who is a generalist and has depth, someone who is technical and strategic, someone who understands not only the work inside the firm, but the competitive landscape out there. We call these people T people, depth, breadth, and technology. <clears throat> Transdisciplinarity is actually the word for these people. Now you might say, how do I become this person as a leader how do I lead people to become this more robust, highly skilled person? I will go into some of the skills on that. Thank you for that. Globally connected world and flat world labor. Those are two other forces that came up in our research. I call it from eBay, I used to say Elance, but now they're upward. eBay, because any company, because of the internet, can become digital like that. If you might remember when eBay come out, came out, if you don't remember it, you probably know Etsy. Right? These are global marketplaces where you can actually set up a storefront, and I did, and cleaned up my closet, and sold all kinds of things, and took international currency in a matter of an hour or two. Amazing. I did not realize that you could become international just like that. Anyone in the world can become international like that. That's great as a company, because you can expand your marketplace. But now let's look at the flip side. Elance or Upwork, I use them too. They're also a marketplace where I actually can go out and find talent. I can find people to help me crunch some data, edit my videos, do some editing, word smoothing for me, for articles, and in some cases get a PhD, to help me maybe for $2 an hour. It's phenomenal. This whole world now has opened up not only the international marketplace, but the ability for us to find labor. Pretty scary as an individual, right? How do you keep yourself above that if you know that your competition isn't really your cubicle mate? 
or your neighbor next door. Your competition is someone anywhere in the world who really wants your job and works hard at it. So we spend a bit of time talking about what is the future? If all of these forces are, are coming at firms and employees, what is the future of employees and firms? Well, let's go back to Apple. You know, Apple in the developer meeting last year said that actually they innovate, not internally, they do innovate internally, but they actually go out to crowdsource. They go out to the world to get ideas from people and really just people who develop apps. And in fact, they pay very good money, $10 billion to 6 million people to create apps for their phones, for the iPad, now for the watch because they realize that the wisdom is not always inside, the wisdom is out in the world, and it's worth paying for. It's quite interesting. Other industries also crowdsource, right? There's initiatives out there where we're seeking the wisdom of the crown to help us cure cancer. Alzheimer's, personal diagnosis, you know? I can go out now and say I have this injury or I have this illness. Somebody in the world must have also had these symptoms. Can you help me? So crowdsourcing has sort of become this new trend where us as individuals, but also companies, can go out and find innovation and pay for it. On the flip side of crowdsourcing, we also have on-demand talent. Very interesting. <clears throat> Using these marketplaces, I can go out and now get a doctor on demand. I just use an app. My husband actually has not gone to a physical doctor in years because he uses a 24 by 7 app called Ask. He's got a whole bunch of them. He's got his lawyers on demand. He has his doctors on demand. He has accountants on demand. He refuses to leave the office because it's too inconvenient, it's too time consuming. And they get rated with stars and references. And he said, you know, how many times have you been misdiagnosed? by a physician because you happen to get the one that was available. And then you kept going back hoping you could get a better diagnosis, right? So he just cuts to the chase and says, give me the five-star doctor, let me look at the references, and I'll just do it online. I mean, really, if they need to see me, we'll just Skype, you know, or FaceTime. If there's no reason for us to be physical anymore. We can get nurses on demand, on demand prescriptions, right? I'm dealing with this now, but in a uh, housebound mother-in-law, who we're figuring out if we can get her on the phone, we can have all the services in the world come to her instead of touching her and moving her out. We just have to get her on the phone and use the technology. But this world has just created <clears throat> new environments for us. I was looking up insurance, by the way. There's an interesting initiative in Australia, Friends Source. Your friends who can't, insure and can't afford insurance are looking for ways that they can get together and co-insure it, right? So you never know when new technologies will enter into your industry. You think that you're solid, you think that you're pure, and you just don't know. So what is the future of the firm? Well, this is where I encourage HR and employees to think about that. Are we letting our firms turn into systems of operations only? Are we allowing employees to position their ideas? Or are we saying, you just run the shop, be the cog in the wheel, and we'll go outside to innovate, right? Questions, you know, or you as an employee, how do I avoid that? How do I avoid becoming that cog in the wheel, which I only have one job to do, rather be moving to a leadership role? Interesting enough, we were chatting about temps. Temps are everywhere, right? We used to think that it's always a temp. We used to think that temps were people who couldn't get jobs. Well, it's the, another new trend is, why would I want to be on the salary treadmill, right? So what's happening is our talent is actually exiting the workforce saying, I'd rather freelance and get big bucks from Apple or Google or, and then I don't have to like, you know, do all those rules and regulations that they have at work but I could create my own thing. And now today you can do that, right? Entrepreneurship is one of the fastest growing spaces, business ownership. So now we're actually, is the creative class leading the firm? 
So what can we do to make sure we keep it vibrant inside? Okay, a little bit on technology changing industry. I like to talk about cars because I think everybody can understand a car. When I grew up, a car had four wheels and you actually had to change its oil by yourself. You ever change your oil? <laughs> Nobody changes oil today. You get an alert. It tells you to drive it in, right? And actually, I had a key that looked like a key. You know what a key looks like? <laughs> but today, our, our basically, <clears throat> our cars have become intelligent mobile devices on wheels. They're basically computers, right? They're moving us around and they're giving us alerts and telling us what to do. And we're just passengers. But I would say actually we've evolved even beyond that. I live in an area where these, these little cars are zipping all over the place with no drivers, right? There's software in a box. We've moved into a software world, right? In fact, my colleagues at Google tell me they wanted to pull the pedals and the steering wheels out of these cars because they're driven by software, GPS, and sensors. There's no need for human intervention at all. There's no need for a steering wheel. And the DMV said, you've got to be crazy. <laughs> Humans and Americans do not, right, they have to be in control. they got to push the buttons. We're so trained now to use this hardware. And so they have to leave them in, at least initially, until people get interested in this and accustomed to this whole concept of autonomous robotic cars driven on software. So we've turned into a software world. And the automotive industry is changing, too. If you look on the left, those are the big ones today, General Motors and Volkswagen, Toyota, Mercedes, the big auto manufacturers. But really, where do you think the automotive industry will be tomorrow? Everybody's making a software car. Apple, Tesla, Google, even Uber. The landscape could change like that. It could move from Berlin and Detroit and end up in my neighborhood and I'm going to have all these like autonomous cars buzzing around by all these software companies that seem to take over the world. And it could happen in your industry <coughs> as well. It makes me think about BMW, they were in our think tank, and they said, you know, not only has the products and the services gotten so technical, but the way we train has to change too. So let me give you an example. This is how BMW trains people to actually work on their cars. And I'll explain the technology. It's a combination of wearable tech, goggles, and augmented virtual reality. Let's take a look. Not only are the products and the services changing, but also the way that we need to think about training our employees. <clears throat> how do we integrate technology into our training? Okay, so let me just go, as we're shifting now from this classical world to a technology world, we talked about a lot of skills, actually 10 skills that might be useful in addition to the skills that they already have. So complex, problem solving, critical thinking, reading, writing, math, they don't go away. I'm not gonna go through all of the skills. I'm just gonna go through a couple. Number one, multimedia literacy. Isn't it interesting that 65 to 75% of us are actually visual learners? 18 to 34 year olds would rather go out to YouTube for a tutorial than to read a book. But for some reason, we keep delivering information and content in text, whether it's to our customers, to our employees, yet we know that people would rather be engaged using some sort of visual media. Let me give you an example. I was over in Amsterdam. It was actually um, a year or two ago. Was, I was on business during the Christmas holidays. And all these, and I wasn't too happy to be there because I really wanted to be home, really. And all these people <clears throat> were running down to the center of Amsterdam. And I said, is there an emergency, right? You know, because I don't speak Dutch. And they go, no, 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 no. This is a really exciting thing going on downtown. And I said, what? They said, well, it's a store opening. I said, store opening? Who cares about a store opening, right? I go, what store is it? They go, H&M. I private shop at H&M. Can you shop at H&M? No. <laughs> so they said, no, 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 Tracy. This store opening is not like any store opening you have ever seen. Let me explain what you're going to see. It's called 3D visual mapping. You're going to take an ugly gray building and you're going to have projection systems 
and audio systems make it come to life. Let me, I took some video clips, let me just show you a couple. Very exciting. Are you sure you're ready for this? Are you sure you're ready for that? I was the first person in the door when they opened it because they got me so excited that I thought something magic was inside. And I got so excited about 3D visual mapping that I went and I've seen hospitals use it as an open. I've seen auto dealers, hotels. It is a visual, it's engaging. Not to say that you can do it in every industry, but the matter that they grab me using multimedia, because I am such a visual person, made me very exciting. Multimedia literacy, a skill. Can you make things more visual and engaging, whether it's customers and employees? Sense making. Do you know in the last two years, we've generated more data than since humans, humankind started? Google's that, another one popped up there. More data, whether it's coming out of our cell phones, our customer databases, you name it. How do you make sense of the data? Right? This is a new skill that we actually have to think about. How do we organize it? Let me give you another example. Back to retail. I got this phone call. Do people know this store called Nordstrom? <laughs> okay, so I got a call from Nordstrom last July. And they said, Tracy, we miss you. I said, you miss me? You don't even know me. And they said, oh yeah, Tracy, we actually do know you. In fact, we've known you now for about three years. You remember when you signed in, you opt in for emails and newsletters and discounts from Nordstrom? Well, we kind of grabbed that data. They said, and you come in the store and you use your credit card and we kind of grabbed that data and we actually think that we know you, you know? And we miss you. You see, because what we figured out is we actually know the clothes, most of the brands that you buy, and we, we know, you know the times of year that you shop, and we know, you know, we think we even know your favorite salesperson, quite frankly. And we miss you because, you see, you usually come in every August and December, but you didn't come in December. And we thought, well, you're a business traveler because we can tell from clothes. And maybe you were on a business trip. Or maybe because it was December's the holidays and you were with your family. But maybe what we're really worried about is that you're at one of our competitors, spending your dollar somewhere else, like Neiman's or Saks or H&M. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do, Tracy. We're gonna leave you a $100 gift certificate in the store, and we want you to come back in August because we miss you. They actually did leave me a hundred dollar gift certificate and actually went into the store. But as soon as I got off the phone with them, I said, that was the creepiest phone call I've ever <laughs> Right? Can you imagine customer service from the store calling you and telling you they're missing? So what do you do? I called up HR. I called up Nordstrom HR and I said, why am I getting this, this creepy phone call from Nordstrom's and, you know, and telling me that they missed me? They said, oh, Tracy, big data data scientists. We actually hired some data scientists. We're trying to figure out how to make sense of the data that we're collecting. Basically, we want to get to know you better so that we have the right products in the store when you come in. Basically, we want to have a relationship with you so that we're always there for you and maybe increase sales. And we want to enhance your shopping experience. But ultimately, it's all about generating sales. Sense making, how do you make sense of all the data? Design mindset, very interesting skill. Are you or can you design your environments or workflow to yield the highest productivity? The healthcare example that came out in our research was really around, are we designing the waiting rooms, the hospital rooms, in the right colors, the right furniture, to put our customers, the patients, at ease. Whether it's pinks or blues or Starbucks. But it's more about internally in the company, is are in your different groups, business units, teams, 
Are you designed to be the most productive? A lot of times we just assume that everybody's going to go into an office and sit in cubicles and be highly productive. And what we're realizing now that that may not be the most efficient productivity. So let me give you an example. Out by me, firms, the big engineering firms, Apple's and Facebook's and Google's say, you know what, engineers, we, the large percentages of, of our employee base are engineers. And actually, engineers are most productive when they're together, 24 by 7, have lots of perks, you know, like food and massages and volleyball courts and are at ease. But basically, the observation is if we keep our engineering community in constant contact with each other, they collaborate more and they come up with more ideas, rather than putting them into cubicle and silos. Right? On the flip side, we had our professional services group. This IBM's, sales groups, Ernst & Young's, they said, you know what, actually our employees are the most productive in a distributed format. We like them to be actually out of the headquarters. We want them at the customer site. We want them somewhere where they're generating the most productive dollars for the firm. Right? In my team, I actually asked them for feedback on how to, could I make you the most productive? And they said if we had a big collaborative project, like working on a book, because it was very motivational. But their researchers and editors, could we all work from home? Because it could save us a lot of money, and a lot of us are night owls, not day owls, you know, day birds. And so it's very interesting, is can you, in your organizations, in your groups, think about how do we increase the productivity in the interest of our groups? Design mindset, it's a new skill. Last one I'm going to go through is novel and adaptive thinking. <clears throat> this is actually one of my favorite skills because it encourages us to think about taking some of the new technologies that you may not be familiar with or just getting accustomed to and borrowing it to resolve a problem you're already solving in a unique or better way. So let me give you an example. 3D printing. 3D printing didn't exist right, like 10, 15 years ago, and now you can walk in and get anything printed up with 3D printing. You get toys, right? You walk into Microsoft with 3D printing you a toy. I've actually seen wedding cake icing get printed off of these printers. I mean, it's pretty amazing. It's profound for manufacturing because that's where the, the most development is of printing prototypes, but it's sort of expanding into other industries. So now we have a plastic surgeon, someone who does reconstructive faces, been doing it for years, replaces people's chins, their noses, their ears, you know, if they've had bad injuries. And he looked at the 3D printer and said, you know, why can't I fill the printer instead of typical ink, right, or plastic? What would happen if I filled up the printer with human collagen, liquid collagen? And what if I could print an ear because that would be healthier, right? And right, better for the patient instead of inserting a foreign object. Let's take a look at Dr. Benasser and his ear. And, and cover and, and put different uh, cells next to each other. Once in an incubator, the tissue fills in and looks white just like real cartilage. Novel and adaptive thinking. Can you borrow a technology and resolve a problem that you're already solving in a unique and better way? <laughs> Is it time for a career selfie? I did a blog on this, right? After I saw that Google statistic about 93 million selfies per day on the Android, and gosh knows how many in the iPhone, I said, I wonder if we're spending this much time on our own career development. And even interesting, more interesting enough, because I was trying to find statistics on, compared to how much time we're taking selfies, do we know how much time that we're planning and how much time we're spending on our own career planning? Okay, so this little dot down here, these are, is one statistic I can find. College students out of college, two years, who could not find a job yet. We're spending an hour and a half a year on personal career planning. Mm. They were, however, spending almost 2,800 hours sleeping. Mm. 
Adults, I couldn't find one. I couldn't find a, a statistic. I could find for adults that what we're doing with our time. So we're buying cars, we're planning vacations, we're looking for houses, we're planning weddings, we're eating, we're drinking, we're going to leisure activities, and we're watching sports. We're doing everything but personal career planning. And why is that important? Well, you might remember in the beginning, I said you're living to a hundred, which means you're potentially going to be working half your life and a third of your day. It's a very different landscape. So doesn't career planning start to become more important if you need to live and work to 100? So my question was, in this blog, I said, what is your playbook, right? What are you doing? Because not only is the world different in digital, but it's actually much more integrated. Technology makes us 24 by 7. So it isn't like we can go to work now and go home. Unfortunately, the work comes home with us. And we can't go home and like forget about our kids when we're at work because they're going to be texting us and meeting us all the time. So the world has gotten, our days have gotten very integrated. And so planning our lives now have to get very integrated. <coughs> Interesting enough, when I was young, in my 20s, I met a gentleman who was 39. And he was CEO of a company, a big company. Now, that means nothing today because I'm surrounded by Mark Zuckerbergs and Marissa Myers, right, and all these people who are heads of companies in their 20s. But it was a big deal. And I asked him, how is it that you got to be a CEO at age 39? And he said, oh, Tracy, he pulled out his wallet, a little piece of crumpled paper, kind of spread it out, you know, just a little lined piece of paper. He said, Tracy, here's how I got to be a CEO at 39. He said, I wrote it down. I wrote it down. He said, it, it his paper sort of looked like that. He had ages on the top, and he had categories on the left. When he wanted to get married, when he wanted to be a manager, when he wanted to be a director, when he wanted to be sick, when he wanted to retire, when he wanted his first kid, second kid, first house, you know, he had all kinds of goals. And he said, it's very interesting. When you write down a goal, all your energy starts to move in that direction. Whether it's, I want to be married at the age of 30, or I want to be the CEO at age 39. So he said, my best encouragement to you is start making timelines and writing down goals. Start with little goals, achieve the goals, and move to big goals. Because everything that you do in your 20s will impact what's going to happen in your 40s. And the activities that you do in your 40s will impact what life will be like for you in your 60s. And I thought about it because I have this very nice neighbor. His name is Herman. He's 98. I love Herman. And I asked Herman, I gave him this sheet, and I said, Herman, are you a planner? And Herman was like, absolutely, I plan my whole life. He said, in fact, I'm still planning. He said, I'm planning to live. He said, when I was 60, I planned to live into 90s. He said, I'm 98 now, and I will be planning to live to at least 105. And he said, the plans are different when you're my age. You can't plan out as far, but you can plan out every day and every week. And he said, let me just tell you my plan. He said, every day I know that socializing is very important. So I try to meet or talk to on the phone at least four people. Physical exercise for me, he said, is very important. He said, I used to walk 10 miles a day. Today I can walk seven. And he has his circuit. He said, reading, right, and communication is very important. He does the crossword puzzle every day, reads one newspaper every day, and one book a week. And he said, and diet is also very important so that I can stay healthy enough, right, as long as, as being sharp enough to 105. He said, the only difference I would say is that when I go to the grocery store and you're 98, my advice to you at 98 is don't buy green bananas because you never know if you're going to outlive them or not. <laughs> Herman, a planner at 98 going to live to 105. I'm going to end up with a final video. It's called The Virtual Choir. It's out on YouTube. The story, I think, 
is just as interesting as the video. It was sent to me from a music teacher. And she said, Tracy, you've got to share this with your groups. So let me tell you the story. There was a music teacher, Eric Whitaker, had students, you know, 12, 13, 14 year old. Comes to class, they sing their choir. One of the students is practicing, right, her piece, and decides instead of waiting for class, she wants feedback. She wants feedback. So she, she tapes herself on her smartphone and sends it into him and says, what do you think? And he said, oh my God, I never thought about that. Having the students actually send me video files of themselves singing the song, we've just been waiting for the physical meeting every week. So he said, well, let me go out to the rest of the class. You all sing that song and send it to me in a video file of your smartphone. And then he said, well, why, why limit it here? He went out to his music conductor friends, right, teachers, and said, have your students come and send me themselves singing the same song, right, on the video. And it went viral. Well, now he has about eight of these things. He created what he called a virtual choir, integrating the multimedia and the songs of all these people. In fact, the virtual choir became a global phenomenon. People now vie to be selected in his virtual choir. I'm going to give you a sample of number three. Almost 4,000 videos from 70 some odd countries. about technology. 